Welcome to the shooting show. This week, Jeff Garrett's back at the pigeons defending a pea crop. Plus, Byron gets all technical with his ballistic gel and gecko ammunition. Jeff Garrett has been called into action urgently to protect a pea plantation. This could be a big job and we can't resist capturing it on film. Well when we came here yesterday afternoon about three o'clock um, there was a lot of pigeons around. It was very encouraging which is uh, one of the reasons why I've come back here today. We uh, sat here, me and my son Justin just sat um, where, we, where we sat this morning and watched them and uh, there's a lot of activity here so it's, uh, it's drawn us back here. Um, to uh, try and control a few pigeons. What we're shooting on is uh, it's, uh, it's sugar beet ground that's been pulled up, very cloddy, uh, and it's been drilled with peas. And the peas have not gone in all that well and the pigeons have found them, so we're here to protect the pea crop, to protect the, um, the peas that have been drilled. Um, so that's the main reason why we're here today. We've had to sit about and watch for a flight of pigeons to start up or we'll find out where the flight is. It's took us longer than anticipated. I mean, we got here this morning at nine, just after nine o'clock, and it's now, um, it's now gone 12 o'clock. The, the high, lots of, lots of, we, we, when, when we was looking here, there was a little flight of pigeons coming over the field and there was a, there was a flight of pigeons coming out across the belt and swinging down the belt and hopefully we're in the right place where they were crossing. Um, and all I've done is just put a standard net hide up. I've grabbed a few bells of ivy from the back here from a, a fallen ivy tree and uh, just, just cut a few old um, beech leaves or branches off a few beech trees in the wood here, which uh, one, it won't damage the trees because we're actually, when you take the bottom branches off the tree, it encourages the tree to grow upwards instead of outwards. Um, so we haven't damaged the tree, but what it's done, it's just broke the hide up and hopefully give it a bit more of a natural surrounding to what we're, or to where we're sitting, we've, we've, we've sighted the hide. Is there's, a, there's a line of pigeons coming straight over the field from a little tiny wood over the other side of that field there. They're coming over the field and also the belt that we just got set up on, on the side of there's been a few pigeons coming down, swinging around over the top of that, and swinging to where we are now. So um, hopefully it's taken us a little bit longer than, than I'd like, but that is pigeon shooting. Um, and hopefully we've got, we're in the right place, basically. We're on a slightly chalky bit of ground, um, and the decoys will, will stand out quite a bit. When, uh, while we was over the other side of the field, there was two or three that landed on this particular patch here and they just stood out really good because it's a bluey pigeon against a real lighty coloured ground. So that's another, another reason why I've, I've plumped for here because any pigeons around the air, if we're not quite in the flight line or they're drifted off, hopefully they'll be able to see the decoy pattern from a distance away and give them all the encouragement to come in. We set up in Jeff's impressive hide and wait for the deeks to work their magic. Before we know it, we're looking at a sky full of birds, and Jeff wastes no time getting to the task at hand. Everything is in place for a good day's shooting, but Jeff still isn't happy. We've, um, we've only been sat up about five minutes. We've had two or three groups of pigeons come round and they look like they're going to decoy really good and they just get to the last minute and they just, just drift away. So something's not quite right with the decoy pattern or the hide. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and just go out there and just rearrange the decoys um, and see if we can make a bit of a difference because 
those two or three little groups, they should have been coming into the decoys, but they just, on the last approach, they just drifted away. Didn't dart away, they just drifted away, which means something's not quite right with the pattern. All that tinkering has done the trick. The woodies are coming thick and fast. Jeff stokes up the Browning Maxes with a fresh set of Ely VIPs and takes aim once more. With everything working in Jeff's favour, he can start to rack up some serious numbers. Just as we start to think about a record bag, our luck takes a turn for the worse. We've been set up now for about an hour, probably out just over an hour, and pigeons have just started decoying really good, shot 25, 30, and uh, up turns a sprayer, which is nothing we can do about it. They've got to do their work, and uh, for the next hour, we're gonna have a sprayer up and down the field. So, um, all in all, not good, but let's just hope uh, the pigeons will keep coming in like they did uh, before we turned up and uh, we'll hopefully we'll get a bag, but um, that hasn't helped matters. With the sprayer bringing a premature end to the proceedings, Jeff can only think about what might have been and hope the pigeons return once the farm has done his work. But when the sprayer finally departs, it turns out that things are even worse than we first thought. Unfortunately, the farmer came on the field, came down the side of the hedge before I realised he was coming here and uh, sprayed the pattern. And I think that made a difference. As you can see, that should be white. It's got a good coating of yellow on it all over its back, as did probably the first 25 pigeons, 30 pigeons that we'd shot. So I'm going to have to keep these separate and unfortunately these ones are going to have to go into the pit because um, there's no way can I put them in the food chain. It's a yeah. sad loss after what had been a really promising first hour yeah, in the hide. But with the sprayer gone, Jeff can console himself by getting back to the shooting. Clearly relishing the chance to hone his shooting skills, Jeff puts the Maxis to good use on the remaining woodies. Despite its earlier spraying, the decoying pattern is still working well. The bag starts to mount and we can finally forget our earlier bad luck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the 
final tally is just short of the enigmatic 100 mark. But who's counted? We've witnessed a pigeon shooting masterclass from one of the best in the business, and you can't complain about that. Right, that's another day finished. Uh, 94 in the bag. It's been a good day today. Decoyed very well. Um, when we got here, had a couple of pigeons come through, didn't want to decoy that well, went out, changed the pattern around a little bit, and uh, they started to decoy in, come in lovely. Uh, halfway through the day, um, we had the farmer turn up with his sprayer, um, sprayed the field, and unfortunately I couldn't get my decoys in in time, and he uh, sprayed half my decoy pattern. And I think that just had a little bit of an edge on it because as the day went on, and after that you could see some of my pigeon decoys had got a, a yellow hint to them, which uh, I'm sure as the pigeons were coming in after that, they could see that because they, they weren't so keen to come in. Uh, and not until I'd built the pattern up again with some fresh ones. One of those things really, can't, can't say nothing about it, just one of those things, but that did hinder the day. And I think that did stop me making the 100 bag. But that's, that, again, that's just one of those things. But all in all, it's been a good day. Um, I've decoyed really well and um, shot the browning, the Maxis browning. You know, really do like these browning automatics. They're just so nice to shoot. Uh, they killed well with it today. Ely cartridges were good. I need some more, Mr. Ely. Um, and all in all, we've had a good day. Jeff there, narrowly missing out on the big one. And now, the shooting show news. This is the Shooting Show News, with the CLA Game Fair less than 12 weeks away. A new Browning 725 and Moroku MK60 were the stars of the show as Browning hosted its 2014 product launch at the Encody Shooting School on Friday. Journalists were introduced to a range of clay and game shotguns, rifles and ammunition. Then they got the opportunity to try some of them on a 60 target layout. We caught up with Browning's David Stapley who told us about the company's focus for 2014. We launched the 725 in a 12 gauge format uh, two years ago in a grade one. We then launched the 725 grade five last year and this is the natural progression on. We hadn't had a 20 gauge in that model so we've launched it this year. People have been waiting for it in a game gun format and um, it's been very well received. I mean for many years it's been sort of the secret gun for, for really top game shops is the Maruko MK60 which is a fixed choke game gun. We've now launched it as the a main product range for this year. The key to this product really is the price. And you can buy a, a pair of guns of that quality for around £5,400, which is outstanding. Yeah, Winchester, Winchester, yeah. It's a big year for Winchester this year. We've, um, we've built a new plant in America in a place called uh, Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, and the whole idea is to, to make the whole process from start to finish more efficient and, and a much higher quality product coming out of the factory now. Uh, we've launched a number of new products this year. Uh, obviously with the new factory uh, we've been able to increase production and, and bring in some new um, product ranges. There's a mood of optimism brewing for the CLA Game Fair 2014 after organisers hosted a press have-a-go day to build interest. As the assembled journalists tried their hands at archery, fishing, equestrianism and timber sports, we caught up with fair director Tony Wall to ask him how the build-up to this year's show was going and whether Blenheim was his favourite location. This is the fifth Game Fair that's been held at Blenheim. This is a fabulous venue, um, it is one of our most popular venues and it does attract, because of its position, it does attract an awful lot of visitors. The main attractions, I suppose, to the visitor would be the gun dogs, the shooting, the fishing, the shopping, stills with their new British Championship um, event that's going to take place here. Gunmakers Row can stand alone as a, a gun show in its own right. It's not long now, about, about 12 weeks, it must be coming up very quickly. Quicker than one would choose in certain aspects, um, I'd have to say, that would be, be fair to say, but we've got, I've got a fabulous team um, that I've been working with, all of whom I've known for a long time anyway, but there's been a real, there is a real enthusiasm and drive to to get to the event and to, and to put on the best show we possibly can. England's Commonwealth shooting team has been announced, or at least the rifle and pistol section of the team. Mick Galt, England's most decorated Commonwealth athlete, will compete for an unprecedented 18th medal in Glasgow. 
He retired after the 2010 Commonwealth Games but has since been tempted back into the sport. Other names on the list include David Luckman, Parag Patel, Cherie Cox, Kenny Parr, Victoria Mullen and Christian Callahan. The Badger Cull could still be rolled out, but not until next year, says Owen Patterson. The Environment Secretary said wider culling had been delayed, not cancelled. And he pledged to do everything he could to curb the spread of bovine TB. According to reports, new cases of TB are doubling every nine years, and more than 32,000 cattle were slaughtered in Britain last year owing to the disease. For more on this story, don't miss Sporting Rifle magazine. And finally, act today to protect your shooting rights. That's the message from the NGO as it urged members to make their views known on the general licence. A natural England consultation on the general licence in England runs until the 19th of May. The NGO has described some of the proposals in the consultation as ludicrous and impractical. NGO chairman Lindsay Waddle asked gamekeepers to read the NGO's official response and follow it up with a personal response of their own. Send yours to the email address on screen now. That was the Shooting Show News. Today is the result of quite a few months preparation for me. Over the next few months on the shooting show, you're going to see me undertake a number of ballistic tests in order for you to understand your calibers and your, the types of bullets that you use a little bit better. We're going to be using ballistic gel and we're going to be using ballistic soap. The ballistic gel is uh, a new synthetic type which isn't affected uh, by temperature um, or humidity. It's quite easy to reconstitute and it's very, very clear. So I hope to be able to bring you some really quite extraordinary pictures of what your bullets do inside a soft tissue medium. The ballistic gel is gonna be strapped to a level plank that I've put out here on the hillside. You need to shoot it as flat as you possibly can so that you get a nice straight trajectory through it. And the ballistic soap is gonna allow us to measure fairly accurately what the permanent wound channel of each caliber produces. What we're gonna do is shoot three different bullet types of a 308 Winchester. We've got the three um, bullet constructions that Gecko produce. We've got uh, the Gecko Plus, we've got the Gecko Express, and we've also got the Gecko Telemantle, which is the standard soft point. We'll start with 170 grain soft point. Gecko call this the Telemantle. Um, I've shot this through a lot of test rifles over the year. Uh, I've hunted with it as well, and performance has been pretty much exactly as you would expect. Uh, in terms of what they say on the back, this little graph that they produce here, um, the three criteria which stand out, precision, flat trajectory, knockdown power, what we'll do is I will get the trajectories and muzzle velocities and energies up on the screen so you can have a look at those. And really this is just the classic bullet. This is a standard soft point and should be sort of all encompassing. Next we have the Gecko Express. We can see here that this bullet clearly has a polymer tip. However, it's not a ballistic tip in the traditional sense. What we have here is essentially a covered hollow point, providing a bullet with excellent aerodynamics and a high BC. According to the stats, it achieves this while maintaining controlled expansion, providing rapid and high energy knockdown performance. These are characteristics you would expect from a premium bullet, but Gecko are offering it at a very affordable level. Lastly, we get to the Gecko Plus. Now, this is the first chance I've had to shoot the Gecko Plus. I put it on some targets uh, further down the range and it's shooting great. I've got it where I need to, to get it on point for the block. In terms of what Gecko say, uh, it's suitable for, we're looking at small, medium deer, we're looking at boar, and we're looking at big body deer. It looks like a picture of a stag that they've got on the back here. So this really is what um, Gecko are pitching as the round to use if you're wanting to shoot those heavier bodied, uh, bigger boned species. What we're going to do is we're going to get over there, we're going to get the rifle set up, we're going to shoot the blocks, we're going to shoot the soap, 
and then we're going to see exactly what story it tells. Well, that's it. We're ready to go. Rifle set up, blocks are on the board. I have to admit that I'm more than just a little bit excited uh, about the prospect of shooting the gel for the first time. What the ballistic gel is representing is the soft tissue in an animal. Now, the bullets will obviously behave differently if they're hitting any kind of harder medium before they hit, hit the, the soft tissue in the center of an animal. We've all seen that when you clip a rib, when you're going into a deer, for example, you end up with a very different kind of uh, damage and, and bullet performance. So what we're going to see here is purely soft tissue performance. But anyway, let's get shooting. We've got block one, shot one, or bullet one. Let's see what happens. Wow. Well, this is interesting. And look what we have here. We've got the bullet. Not what I expected. Well, even without actually doing the measurements, which we'll do when we get back, you can get a pretty good idea of exactly what's gone on here. The bullet which penetrated the least was the, the Gecko Plus, and I found it between the two blocks. It had just enough energy to pop out and it did cause some damage just on the, the front edge of the, the second block, um, but not enough to actually force this very well expanded bullet um, through into the gel. And it was just lying on the wood here. And the, the Gecko Express and, and the Telemantle, which is the standard soft point, seem to have penetrated pretty much the same amount, but possibly the, the standard soft point has penetrated a tad further. Well, what we need to do now is I'm going to go back, I'm going to get these cleaned up so that you can get a really good picture inside, and we can talk about the, the wound tracks side by side and get a, a really good comparison. Now that we're back, we can really dig into the results. The first thing is that my hillside evaluation of penetration was actually incorrect. What I neglected to remember was that I've reconstituted the blocks into a longer block now. So uh, when I said that the Gecko Plus actually penetrated the least, that was actually wrong. And now that I've taken the, the measurements correctly, given the express block, which I had shot previously, we can see that they tie in um, a lot more in line with what I was expecting. So I've taken the measurements, I've got it on my computer, so let's just go through each one and see what story it tells. Let's start with the Express. Now we can see, uh, if we look at the block here, explosive. You, within the first few inches, we've got the vast majority of the, the fracturing in the block. There's a lot of fragments coming off, we can see in the center a little plastic tip. And as we get to about halfway along the block here, and I'm going to put all these uh, actual numbers and statistics for comparison up on the screen, we can see that the, uh, the energy is starting to peter off. It's, it's blown most of its energy into the block. About another two inches beyond the end here, uh, the, the bullet stops. And I've got the bullet just down here, and we're going to weigh that in a little bit. If we now turn our attention to the Gecko soft point, we can see we've got a fairly even uh, wound track and f fracturing along here. It stops about a third of the way along and then we end up with the bullet shedding quite a lot of lead and we can see if we look along this track here right to the end of the block and I shot into the back end of this block, this is where the bullet was, was caught, 
we can see bits of lead starting to shed. Lastly, we've got uh, the Gecko Plus. Now, this is probably the most interesting of the three. If we look right where it entered, we can see about half a dozen little fragments of the copper jacket. They haven't gone very far, but each one of those, I'm assuming, is from the nose of the bullet. You can actually see um, pre-fractures in the nose so that you end up with a nice controlled expansion. You have a brilliant wound channel and a lot of energy released over quite a length. The, the actual fracturing track of the Gecko Plus is the most extreme for the longest period. And that really is quite interesting. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut out this bullet. We're going to weigh them and we're going to have a little look at, at uh, bullet weight retention. If I just have a look at what I've got written down here and I've worked out in percent, the Gecko Plus, which of course is our big game round, has a weight retention of 96%, which is very good. Uh, and it is also the widest in diameter. It has the biggest mushrooming effect. So that's exactly what you want when you're talking about dropping big game. Of course, you also want penetration. It didn't actually penetrate the furthest, which was a bit surprising, the soft point did, but it did have the longest fracturing channel beyond the actual just diameter of the bullet traveling. So although the penetration was not quite as far, the penetration that was causing damage beyond the diameter of the bullet was indeed the greatest. With the lowest weight retention, surprisingly, it was actually the soft point. The Express had a weight uh, retained of 72% and the soft point was 70%, so just a hair's breadth between them. In terms of the ballistics inside the block, it is exactly in line with what you would expect comparing those two. With the greatest penetration um, of all three, we have the soft point at 68 centimeters. And with the least and most explosive early on in the block, we had the Express. Uh, I'm also going to put up the permanent wound cavities that we've tested in the ballistic soap. We're going to talk more about ballistic soap and a lot more to do with different bullet types, um, distances, velocities in the coming weeks. But this is just a taster. It's too much to, to go into any more detail. But what I'm going to try and do is deliver this in a way that's manageable and digestible. If you really want to get into this, it gets incredibly complicated. I'm going to go back up to the range, do a bit more testing, and in a few weeks' time, you'll see a little bit more. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been The Shooting Show.